Coming up next on Making Moves, Michael Blaylock's final words to the JTA board as he hands over the reins as CEO to Nathaniel Ford. What should Southside Boulevard look like 20 years from now? JTA is asking residents to help decide. And will history repeat itself when it comes to streetcars in Jacksonville? I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. Those stories and much more next on Making Moves. Welcome to Making Moves, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. Our top story, the transition is complete at the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. Nathaniel Ford officially succeeded Michael Blaylock as the chief executive officer at the authority during the December board of directors meeting. Community leaders and other well-wishers packed the boardroom to say thank you and one final goodbye to the man who has worked at the JTA for 30 years, including the past decade as its CEO. When we go on to a new career or retire or whatever it might be, you always wonder if you made a difference. And what I said to Michael was, you can rest assured you have made a difference in this community, in this job, in doing what you have done for so many and again, that word vision keeps cropping up because of your great vision that you have had and your ability to work with everyone and every level. You have really made a difference and you have made a big difference in the lives of a lot of people. And the young men that you have talked to within our program, man, they really do appreciate you and the time that you have spent with them. And I really wish you would continue to come by and talk with these young men, man, and inspire them to be a man like yourself or other great men like you. About 10 years ago, I was looking for some reliable transportation to take seniors to a Thanksgiving luncheon that I've been holding now for 26 years. And I asked them to help me to be able to transport my seniors to a Thanksgiving luncheon. And of course, we held the 26th one on November 20th. But before he handed over the keys to the executive office, Blaylock took the opportunity to thank the board, JTA staff, and send out a message about the JTA's mission, who some have suggested should be minimized. And do not, for the life of you, do not allow anybody to, to, to uh, reduce your mission uh, as a transportation authority. You're one of uh, six unique organizations in the country that does it all. Then in true Blaylock style, he introduced Ford as only he could. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> members of the board of directors, the CEO of the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, Mr. Nathaniel P. Ford. <laughs> Of course, we're looking forward to having Mr. Ford being a permanent fixture here on Making Moves in the very near future. Well, six of the original seven counties of the Regional Transportation Study Commission have approved a plan to embark on the development of a full-scale regional transportation plan. As Making Moves, Bill Milnes reports, after two years of planning and deliberation, now the really hard work begins. For the past two years, nearly two dozen leaders from seven area counties have been working to determine the feasibility of joining forces to provide all levels of transportation services to the region. That two-year effort resulted in six of those counties approving a plan to take the next step in the creation of a regional transportation authority. Ava Parker led the study commission's efforts. Today it was a, a big step forward in um, creating greater economic development, creating you know, opportunities for more jobs, and just creating a group working together to achieve what's best for our region. But knowing what's best for the region and being able to achieve success are not a given here. As with most things, the biggest hurdle will likely be finding a revenue source. The biggest hurdle that we're going to find probably is funding for the funding mechanism to make this thing a reality. Where is the money coming from? 
that will fund the projects that we're going to need in this region? Is it from the state? Is it from the individual counties? How's that going to go? That's going to be the biggest hurdle. Once that's in, I think we'll, we'll see that uh, they'll function as we designed them to do. A skeptic since the beginning, St. John's County Engineer and Study Commission Representative Joe Stevenson says he's seen the light. Stevenson says he's convinced a regional approach to solving transportation issues is the way to go. This process has pretty much convinced me that there is some real potential for St. John's County to improve its transportation system by working regionally with partners in other counties. And that's a revelation to me after working in St. John's County for 25 years. Palatka Mayor Vernon Myers is overcoming trust issues that each county would do what's right for the group and not just for itself, allow the commission to move forward to the next step. Myers says a regional authority could represent more mobility opportunities to his smaller and more rural Putnam County. Connectivity to Jacksonville and the other major urban areas is very important for us and we want that to be the result. With this foundation in place, the commission now has five years to find an equitable and continuing funding source and determine how the regional authority will be structured, managed, and by whom. Like we said, the really hard work is just beginning. In Jacksonville, Bill Milnes, JTA, making moves. If after five years, final implementation for a regional transportation plan is not yet in place, the group will disband. In other news, a longtime JTA board member has accepted a new high-profile job in Central Florida. Attorney Ava Parker has been named the new Chief Operating Officer at the Florida Polytechnic University in Lakeland. Parker tells Making Moves that she's excited about this new opportunity, but it will not affect her status on the JTA board, where she plans to remain an active member. Parker has served on the JTA board since 2006 and was its chairwoman from 2008 through 2010. In our ongoing series, looking at the major economic impact JTA has had on the Jacksonville area, we want to take you to a key corridor on the city's south side. With the possible exception of I-95, J. Turner Butler Boulevard may be one of the most important highways in North Florida. It was built by JTA on the foundation of hopes, dreams, and a vision for future economic development. It's also a critical artery connecting Jacksonville with the beaches. But as Making Moves Terry Casey explains, no one could have predicted what an economic powerhouse the JTB corridor would eventually become. J. Turner Butler Boulevard. The road begins at Phillips Highway, swings past I-95, then heads east. It comes to an end at A1A in Jacksonville Beach. JTB has been in use for 39 years now, which makes it the new guy in town, at least compared to Beach Boulevard 60 years and 100 years for Atlantic Boulevard. But JTB is a different animal, nearly all limited access, no traffic lights, no stop signs. When it was first built, a lot of people did call it a road to nowhere, but some others saw it as a road to economic development. In either case, it looked a lot different then than it does now. I used to drive uh, Butler Boulevard to work. Steve Lindorf heads Jacksonville Beach City Planning and Development. He started crossing JTB 27 years ago, not long after it opened. Once you pass 95 and went through some of the early office buildings at South Point after that, there was nothing. So it was uh, kind of a uh, pleasant but rather lonely drive into, into work on uh, back in those days. Oh, I think it was characterized even then as a road to nowhere, and uh, it seemed like it to some extent, even until you got to A1A. You didn't know that there was civilization in that part of Duval County. Except for UNF, open for seven years before JTB came along. It took some vision. It had more vision than I would have had at that time uh, to realize that eventually this corridor is going to grow. UNF president and former Jacksonville mayor John Delaney. Florida's a growth state. Jacksonville's a growth city. 
and you know the population was going to top a million in terms of the metropolitan area. So you had to have this road. It's one of the things that we promote is that we're just you know a few seconds off a major interstate. You're a few minutes from the beach. You're a few minutes from the downtown. It's a major advantage to, to the university. UNF has more than 17,000 students. UNF is essentially the population center of Northeast Florida. They look to increase that number to 25,000 and have plenty of land on which to do it. But what if JTA had never built Butler Boulevard? Well, it would have been impossible to grow as quickly uh, and as substantially as UNF has, absent that the, the JTB corridor. That corridor has become, in a sense, the new heart of Jacksonville. Emily Liska heads the Jacksonville Historical Society. The construction and the development along both sides of that corridor are just amazing. All the major names in Jacksonville development have been associated with development along those corridors. Families with names like Hodges, Davis, Skinner, and Gate Petroleum's Herb Payton donated the land for corridors at JTB interchanges. And they've brought us nationally known corporations. They've brought to us much of what is today's lifestyle in Jacksonville. The development, growth, and rising land values that follow JTB changed the economic landscape. You've got the town center, which people tend to call the new downtown. Well, that's nice. It really is nice. St. John's Town Center opened just a few years ago and is already an economic giant, a destination that draws more than 10 million people a year from across Northeast Florida. The Simon Property Group owns it, and Sal Saldana is general manager. When you have a center that's 100% leased and it's doing as well as it is, and we have most of the exclusive stores in Northeast Florida, there's no doubt that this center is successful because of where it is and the city that embraced it. It makes it one of the better properties uh, of the nation. No question about JTB's impact on the town center. No doubt that highway truly has made a, uh, an incredible impact on our, on our shopping center. At our end here in Jack's Beach, we have lots of commercial, lots of retail, lots of entertainment, restaurants. Those wouldn't exist without the residential development in Ponte Vedra and, and Jack's Beach. Both of those places would be pretty sleepy if it wasn't for Butler Boulevard. Butler Boulevard and Jack's Beach are, are, are hand in glove, I think, in terms of uh, what we were and what we've become. The Mayo Clinic, you know, where, where, where would the Mayo Clinic be if Butler Boulevard hadn't been there? The residential developments on the western end of J. Turner Butler all wouldn't have existed or been possible without J. Turner Butler, or it would have been far more expensive Certainly without Butler Boulevard, I think it's unimaginable for most of us to uh, figure out where the growth that it's brought would be, perhaps another place. But without Butler Boulevard and no substitute, we would not have the economic <laughs> engine that we have today that that road has brought. On J. Turner Butler Boulevard, Terry Casey for Making Moves. But still to come on Making Moves, plans are underway now for a Southside Boulevard of the future. We'll explain. Then a little later, we'll go back in time when streetcars were a main source of transit here in Jacksonville. Those stories straight ahead. Imagine taking a gondola ride through the canals in Venice, experiencing the breathtaking magnificence of the Eiffel Tower, or riding a legendary double-decker bus through the streets of London. For most of us, these are just dreams that will never come true, but they could. Think about saving hundreds, even thousands of dollars a year by doing one simple thing, parking your car and taking JTA instead. Save money, ride JTA, and make your dreams a reality. There's no better place to be on game day than Everbank Field watching your hometown Jaguars. And there's no better way to get to the stadium than on the JTA Stadium Shuttle. Single game tickets start at just $7. Buy your tickets online at JTAFLA.com, at the JTA Admin Building downtown, or at any JTA Stadium Shuttle lot. The JTA Stadium Shuttle. We've been all in for 18 consecutive years. Finally, we had a weekend away and we couldn't wait to see what Jacksonville had in store. We jumped into a cab and cruised downtown. 
They had a huge jazz fest, and everyone was dancing in the streets. We went to this Riverside Arts Market. There were all these farmers with local fruits and vegetables. And just amazing. We had a private wine tasting. And then we were off to this beer fest where the locals just took us in and made us feel like one of them. Skyway was a pretty cool way to see the city. We escaped on a water taxi with views that were just spectacular. Then we plunged back into the city for the game of a lifetime. Thing is, we didn't get away from anything. We got away to everything. Have your biggest weekend ever. Visit Jacksonville. That was awesome. Bernadine Jensen takes the community shuttle to the grocery store, pharmacy, and even doctor's appointments anytime she wants to go. Good morning, how are you? I quit driving when I was 88, because I always said, oh, people shouldn't drive. Mm -hmm. Well, when I decided you're old, you better stop. She knows that family members would help when possible, but she says it's not necessary as long as the community shuttle is around. I tell them what time my appointments are, and they'll tell me what time the bus will be there. Welcome back to Making Moves. We've all dreamed about what we would do if we won the lottery. Well, transportation agencies dream too. Nearly all of the major projects ever completed here in Jacksonville started as just a vision on a piece of paper. Well, the JTA is asking people on the South Side to do a little dreaming of their own. The goal, determining the future of South Side Boulevard. Southside Boulevard is well known for traffic. It's estimated that more than 50,000 cars can be seen every day on some part of this artery that stretches from the Arlington Expressway to Phillips Highway. It has uh, commercial, it has high density residential, it has uh, neighborhood commercial, it has low density housing, and then again uh, terminates again in another uh, major commercial area. But a lot of these areas are also in flux. They're in transition themselves. But can you imagine how many more vehicles will be on Southside Boulevard in the year 2040? And just how will that change the look of this area? Well, people who live and work here can relate to the challenges. Five o'clock during rush hour, just traveling down here through the parking lot, going the back way, whether it's through the condominiums back there or the office parks, just using side roads to disperse away from Southside Boulevard. The JTA is already looking into the future. With no crystal ball available, the JTA is working with many groups and city leaders to come up with a Southside vision on mobility as well as growth and development. We're talking about where, how transit will fit. We're talking about how uh, traditional traffic or uh, transportation modes, trucks, uh, will fit into that. We're talking about how uh, commercial nodes along that corridor will be affected, maybe even the introduction of transit-oriented developments at key nodes. Mm -hmm. From Regency Square all the way to Avenues Mall and parts in between, Southside Boulevard really does have just about everything. Consider this, businesses large and small, as well as older established neighborhoods and brand new subdivisions are all located on this corridor. So when it comes to preparing a vision for the future of Southside Boulevard, it can be a major undertaking. We see a lot of corporate traffic, not a lot of pedestrians, but a lot of corporate traffic, especially during the week. Um, back and forth. I think that if they spent time out here, they could easily see, you know, what needed to be done. I think it'd probably be a, a, a definitely a, a, a little difficult to get a consensus because everybody's wanting something you know, different. But I truly believe that you know, as, as a society, we should be able to come together and figure out what, because it all impacts everybody. I think we can come up with a solution, so solutions that would have an impact. This highway is a far cry from the two lanes that defined Southside Boulevard back in the 60s. Chad Pereira owns a salon on Southside Boulevard and says he hopes the future will bring a better use of public transportation. I can't imagine 2040, yeah, this, this, this will probably change. Just to look how much has changed in the last 10 years. You're, wow, uh, that would be amazing uh, what, how much traffic it might be then and how much people are actually coming to Jacksonville. A citizens advisory group, including residents, community leaders, and other interested citizens, will work together with a technical advisory group to draft an initial visioning report that will go to the JTA board. So, there's still time to be involved. 
the final Citizens Advisory Group meeting will be held in late January or early February. And you can keep updated on the Southside Visioning Study on our website, jtafla.com. JTA Skyway stations continue to get a makeover. Central Station, located next to the Omni Hotel downtown, was the first of the stations to get new escalators installed. Work is now underway to replace the escalators at the Convention Center Station. Hemming Plaza and Rosa Park stations are next in line to get new escalators. Those are scheduled for installation in early 2013. Well, a few months back, we told you about a new FDOT project that would impact several neighborhoods in the San Marco area and tens of thousands of daily commuters. Construction on the $200 million Overland Bridge project is scheduled to begin after the first of the year. Now, one of the key elements of this project will be replacing the badly deteriorating deck on the bridge. The project is also expected to improve the connections between Phillips Highway and San Marco, as well as provide direct access from the interstate in both directions. Now the crossover from the Main Street Bridge to the Hendricks Avenue ramp will also be eliminated to improve safety for drivers. That project is expected to take three years to complete. Much of the project though will be done at night to lessen the burden on both residents and the traveling public. Still to come on Making Moves, we'll go back in time when streetcars were a main source of transit here and find out if history is about to repeat itself. That story is straight ahead. Imagine taking a gondola ride through the canals in Venice, experiencing the breathtaking magnificence of the Eiffel Tower, or riding a legendary double-decker bus through the streets of London. For most of us, these are just dreams that will never come true, but they could. Think about saving hundreds, even thousands of dollars a year by doing one simple thing, parking your car and taking JTA instead. Save money, ride JTA, and make your dreams a reality. family member of mine was in the hospital and I spent a lot of time in a waiting room <laughs> and uh, realized I'm like you know this is a perfect opportunity to just brighten someone's day so I started doing quick sketches of dogs and leaving them around the hospital and, and now some of the random locations where she frequently makes a drop is along JTA transit stops Yvonne says her inspiration comes from her early childhood experiences of riding the bus with her mom it, there was always a visual of her sitting at a bus stop with us, um, you know, holding me and my sister sitting next to hers. I it just kind of realized, I'm like, you know, there's probably a lot of other single mothers who are riding buses or public transportation. So I actually decided to hit up JTA bus stops and just leave little, little pieces of art around, um, you know, uh, just to basically brighten, you know, someone's day. And that's what fuels Yvonne's commitment of bringing art to the people. She knows the impact a simple drawing or painting can have on someone who finds her work. On a sunny day, she makes a drop at a Regency bus stop, much to the delight of the person who finds it. That's right. It really helped me in my day because, you know, I wasn't really on my, up on my toes today, but this, this really puts something in my heart right now. Art is very powerful. It's a powerful tool that can be used to uplift you, your quality of life. Um, it can change your day, it can change the whole direction of, of where your day was going. There's skyways right outside my studio, so I ride it a lot uh, during the week to, to come here and avoid traffic and all that good stuff. And so there's times where I'm just riding it and I'm just like, hmm, this is a good spot to leave something and I'll just leave it there and walk away. And Welcome back to Making Moves. Cities across the country, from Portland, Oregon to Tampa, Florida, and many places in between, are falling in love with streetcars again. Portland is at the forefront of the trend with streetcars up and running and expansion already underway. In large part, big money is fueling this contemporary wave of streetcar mania. As Making Moves, Terry Casey shows us, streetcars have a history here in Jacksonville too. The question is, will they stay in the past or re-emerge to become part of the nationwide renaissance. 
So what was it like when the streetcars showed up in Jacksonville? I would say it was the height of Florida's Victorian era. Emily Liska heads the Jacksonville Historical Society. It was the fall of 1880 before we really got streetcars going, and then they were known as hay burners, called hay burners because mules pulled them. Electricity changed all that. The electrification meant more streetcar lines, more modernity. It was very exciting for the city. And eventually, those streetcar lines, like a spider web, stretched in all directions to form a network that even reached across the river. Well, most historians will tell you that the streetcars were all about development. Uh, in fact, there were developers who built the streetcar lines, including the line that went all the way out to Ortega. Jacksonville's streetcar system died in the 30s, steamrollered by buses that could go where the streetcars couldn't. The buses right next to the streetcar on the final day in downtown Jacksonville. And what a poignant photograph for all of us to look at and lament the loss of this very romantic form of transportation. But streetcars may be on the way back with a different look and fresh attention from developers ready to spend big bucks to build nearby. The Pearl Line is an example that people always point to as far as you know the development that can occur around a streetcar line. JTA Regional Planning Chief James Boyle is taking a hard look at the streetcar revivals in Portland and other cities with good reason. Within the past year, they have a billion dollars of permitted development ready to go just within the corridor of that particular route. The revival has spread to Seattle, Tucson, Dallas, Atlanta, Tampa, and other cities. Boyle led a preliminary study to see where streetcars might work again in Jacksonville. Ironically, it's really the same neighborhoods in downtown um, that where streetcars originally were. This is Edison Avenue in Brooklyn, where streetcars used to run during their heyday and where they may run again if that streetcar renaissance takes hold. There's lots of vacant land that's just sitting there, you know, just sort of waiting for a catalyst or something to happen. And I think if there were a streetcar line somewhere in that vicinity, I think we would be shocked at the amount of development that would occur just in, in that area between Riverside and downtown. Riverside is grappling with parking and traffic congestion issues stemming from development there. I honestly believe that, you know, a streetcar um, could really help uh, with that connection between downtown and Riverside and give people other alternatives other than getting in their car and driving. So why should the city jump on that streetcar bandwagon? Well, I think because it works. Um, you look at other cities, uh, it's working for them. In Jacksonville, I'm Terry Casey, for Making Moves. And that wraps up this edition of Making Moves. We hope you'll be joining us again real soon. Now, if you missed any part of the show or just want to watch it again, complete episodes of Making Moves are always available online at JTAFLA.com. And of course, make sure to stay in touch with us on Facebook or your YouTube channel, JTA904. For CEO Nathaniel Ford and the entire Making Moves team, I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. We'll see you the next time we're Making Moves.